In a few moments, you will be invited to come forward. I will dip my thumb into ashes and make the sign of the cross on your forehead and will say these words to you. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. In other words, you are going to die. Well, have a good night, everybody. <laughs> That's all I've got. I mean, talk about it's such a strange practice, right? We do this every year on Ash Wednesday. We tell each other, you are going to die. And we think about it, our society spends billions of dollars every year to avoid facing the reality of our deaths. So we do everything in our power to live longer, to look younger, just anything to stave off that unavoidable threshold that every single one of us is going to face one day. We are dust and we will return to dust. We are going to die. So this Ash Wednesday feels um, particularly poignant for me because I just got back from spending a month in Korea with my parents. My mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease last year, as many of you know, and my 84-year-old father has been taking care of her. So he's a retired pastor, and she's been faithfully at his side, supporting him after all of these decades in ministry. And they've lived these really full, active, fruitful lives of service. It's like the circle of their lives and influence has encompassed thousands of people, hundreds of missions and projects and books and campaigns. And so it was quite stark to be with them this past month and to see that circle drawn so much smaller, like with just the two of them living this very small, simple, quiet life centered on the needs of my mom. I mean, I'm 50 years old, but you know, watching them in their 80s, I just kept thinking, man, aging is no joke. A Parkinson's disease is no joke. It's like slowly but surely you begin to lose control of your body you know, and all the things that I take for granted, you know, but for you, if you have that disease that you took for granted before, just things like walking and getting out of bed and changing your own clothes and being able to go to the bathroom, all those things are now a struggle and you're completely dependent on other people for your basic needs. And it's so humbling and humiliating. And it's heartbreaking you know, to see someone that you love diminish physically. You know, I was so grateful for the time with them. It was so beautiful and so joyful to be with them. And yet it was also, I felt such a deep sense of sadness the whole time. It was just like this undercurrent running through my time with them. And I would find myself like fighting back tears in the most like random moments and still do. And I realized I was grieving the fact that my mom is not immortal, that she's not going to live forever. And of course, like, I know that intellectually, and emo but emotionally, like, I have such a hard time, you know, accepting that. So coming face to face with that reality on this trip made my time there extremely clarifying. So like in my normal life, like I'm such a driven person. Like I'm a workaholic, as Jimmy will tell you. I don't have great boundaries. Um, I don't accept my limits. I don't, I tend to often not prioritize my loved ones. And you know, there's a whole host of reasons for why I am the way I am, you know? And, and at least some of that comes from just my own insecurities and sense of inadequacy, always feeling like I'm not good enough and I need to sort of prove myself. I've definitely struggled with imposter syndrome. And you know, I'm addicted to sort of email and, and technology. My phone is never far from my hand. Like the most important thing that I did while I was in Korea was hold my mother's hand. And when she closed her eyes at nighttime as she fell asleep, 
and to steady her as she walked from one part of the room to the other. You know, as she helped, I tried to help her as she struggled to get up out of her chair. And while I was there, I didn't take a single moment for granted with her. And so for that one month, I stopped running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And I just loved her. And she let me. So why do we do this? Why every Ash Wednesday do we tell each other that we're going to die? It's because death is clarifying for us. Because death reminds us of who we are, that we're human, that we're vulnerable, and that more than anything else, that we were made to love. But we forget this, right? We forget that about ourselves. We forget that we're human and that we're mortal, that God gave us bodies that are always trying to tell us something, and we never listen, and we run them into the ground. We forget that we're vulnerable, and that right under the surface, that we're sad, and we're scared, and that we hurt. We forget that what makes us human is that we love, that we were created in love by God, and we were created to love. My friend Rich Velotis um, has a book called Good and Beautiful and Kind, and he talks about how when Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment, he responded with absolute clarity. It's to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And so Rich writes, if the greatest commandment given by Jesus is rooted in love, the greatest sin and perhaps all sin, must in some way be the rejection of this command. This is what makes sin so pernicious. It orients us inward. It curves us in on ourselves, and in so doing, it uproots love, goodness, beauty, and kindness. Now, how might that framework help us rethink how we typically view what sin is? that it's not primarily about doing bad things and trying to avoid doing bad things. It's about a failure to love God, love our neighbor, and love ourselves. You know, loving myself is not selfish and self-centered. It simply means learning to love myself and see myself the way that God loves and sees me. When we fail to love God and our neighbor and ourselves, we become less human. We become less our true selves, made in the image of a good and loving and beautiful and kind God. Now, so I'll be honest, um, I don't love repenting. <laughs> like, in fact, I am almost never in the mood to repent. And every year, it's like Lent is actually not, it's not my favorite season in the church calendar. It always catches me by surprise. I'm always like, it's Lent again? Like, I just, I repented last year. And, and yet, at the same time, I'm so grateful for Lent. Because what Lent does is it calls me back to myself. It calls me back to my true self in God and the things that deep inside I long for. Things like love and goodness and beauty and kindness and wholeness. I mean, don't you long for that for yourself and for our world, for others? So what Lent does is it kind of interrupts our like modus operandi, you know, our normal way of doing things. And it helps like disrupt the neural pathways in our brains where our behaviors just become automatic and instinctual, where we don't even think twice. But first, as we enter Lent, we need to become aware, you know, to become open, and just check in with ourselves and say, okay, where in my life have I fallen short? Where in our life together have we fallen short of loving God? and loving our neighbor, and loving ourselves. What are we longing for? What are those desires that have now formed us that drive our behaviors? And what are like the true desires beneath that desire? How can we open ourselves up to the loving presence and activity of this beautiful and good and kind God who invites us back into love? 
You know, and so we don't primarily like kind of think our way into this. We need to practice it. We need to embody it on like a flesh and blood level. And so Leisha's gonna come up here and she's gonna lead us in an embodied practice that's gonna help us just open up to God in this season of Lent. So as Christine reminded us, we want to accept that invitation to return above all else to love, to God, and to remember that that invitation begins in the body. As we know and are known of God in the experience of being human, blood and bone, breath and spirit. So we're going to honor the pause that is lent today and turn inward to experience a deeper sense of communion with God. And so I invite you to join me in this brief embodied prayer. And so as you are already seated, just make sure you're comfortable in your seat. Find an easy resting place for your hands. Maybe they're on the tops of your thighs. And if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes, trusting this space and the people to just be here as you're guided by my voice. And so for, as we begin, just inhabit this posture of prayerful awareness, awareness to God, telling God you're here. And just breathe deeply deeply and evenly, in and out, just three sets on your own time. As we continue to practice, um, just remember to keep coming back to that gentle, easy breath. So now I'll invite you to just cup your hands in front of you and place them, the edges of your palms, just at the top of your forehead and maybe gently lean in your chin, chin to chest. And here we'll just breathe for a second. As we remember that we set our intention to be in alignment with the Spirit of God. We pray for clarity of thought and mind as we connect with our ultimate desire, our ultimate and deepest desire, which is to know and be known of God. And so just Hold this pose, this posture, for two breaths. You can release that posture slowly and just bring your hands to the sides of your head for your ears. And we'll land here and breathe for a second. We pray in this season that we might listen and hear and obey the whisper of your voice, O oh Lord, as you lead and guide us. May we attend to and trust the signals you send. Just breathe here for a moment. Next, we'll bring our hands just at the tops of your eyelids, kind of covering your eyes maybe a bit. And this gesture is just pointing to our eyes for sight. And 
So Lord, give us eyes to see spiritual insight into the things of God. May we recognize your activity among us. May we truly see you be made aware. Two breaths there. Just release that posture and look at your hands. Breathe for a second. In this posture of our hands, I just want us to, to notice and to be mindful of our labor. Our labor is unto you alone, O oh God. And because of that, we can know a sense of liberation and rest. And so as we take those two deep breaths, maybe take a moment to just massage your hands, maybe thumb on the inside of your palm, left and right, right and left. It's not really right or wrong for this. But just attend to your hands as you think of the work and service that you are called to. remembering that it is all unto God. And so connect to that sense of liberation and rest. Finally, we will cross our arms across our chest with our hands landing on our shoulders. Just breathe here for a moment as you relax your chin to your chest. Help us, O oh God, to lean into a season of Sabbath rest. As we free ourselves from the burden of doing and accomplishing, Lord, we place our trust in you. Just here, just quiet, be still for a moment. Sabbath rest. On your next inhale, we'll end as we began, returning to that posture of awareness. And this time we're going to let our hands land at our chest, just one on top of the other. Three breaths here. We return to you, O oh God, responding to your perpetual call to love. May we lean into this Lenten pause, knowing that the consciousness of our mortality brings us the most profound appreciation for life in a body. May we receive it as a gift, life when we are young, a life when we are old, heart, soul, mind, and body. We give it all to you, Lord. And so we're just gonna repeat those gestures one after the other. So we have our gesture for our forehead, right, for insight. We move to the ears for attention. Our eyes for vision. Our hands for work. Crossing our chest for rest, finally landing at our heart to symbolize return. We'll do it one more time, and 
this time without words as you pray it with your body. And so just do it as you remember it. Amen.